It's good to see everybody this blessed Lord's Day. And I do invite you to turn with me in your copy of God's Word. I want to read a couple scriptures together before we seek the Lord in prayer. And I invite you to turn, first of all, to 1 Timothy chapter 3. No, I'm sorry, excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 3. And as I mentioned last week, we believe here at Bethany Baptist that the regular diet of the preaching of the church ought to be preaching chapter by chapter, verse by verse, as God has given it to us in His Word. But nonetheless, there is also a very appropriate place for topical preaching. And uh, oftentimes, working your way through books of the Bible, you will hit various subjects, but you won't necessarily be able to deal with them in depth. And so, uh, these last two weeks, last week we looked at the subject, the topic of seeking God's guidance. And this morning, I want us to consider the subject, the topic together, of the importance of being students of God's Word, readers of God's Word. And so, I want to open up by reading... Uh, the divinely inspired Word of God together from a couple places. First of all, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Look with me and let's read verses 15 and 16 together. This is God's Word for 2 Timothy 3, 15 and 16. The Apostle Paul writes to his young protege Timothy, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And then turn over with me, if you will, to the last book of our Bible, the book of Revelation, chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, and let us read verse 3 together. Revelation 1, verse 3, this is the Word of God. The Apostle John writes, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Amen. Let us seek God's help in prayer before we come to the preaching of His Word. Let's pray together. Our gracious God and Father, we thank You this morning for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank You that He is the Word of God who became flesh, that He is truly, uh, totally divine, totally human, our perfect representative before You. We thank You that we have such a faithful high priest who forever lives, that He might forever intercede in our behalf. Our Father, we thank You this morning that Christ is all that we need that He Himself is our sufficient Savior who has brought His sinful people and presented them holy and blameless before His Father. We thank You for His perfect life. We thank You particularly, even as we'll consider this morning, His perfect obedience and how He was the perfect student of Scripture. We thank You, Father, for His sacrificial death in behalf of His people in which He bore our sins in His sinless body. We thank You for His glorious and powerful resurrection from the grave, that He is not dead, as are all of the other self-professed saviors of the world that have come and have gone, but our Lord Jesus is the only one who proved Himself to be the one that even death cannot hold, that He is victorious over sin, He is victorious over Satan, our enemy and accuser, such that none of the accusations Satan would bring against any one of God's elect can stand. And we thank You that He has risen and now even reigns at Your right hand as King of kings and Lord of lords, and that He will return again to save His people. Father, we thank You that You have given us Your Word that have taught us all these things. We confess, even as we've been teaching our our children in their catechism, we would be ignorant if we did not have Christ as our prophet as He is revealed to us in Your Holy Word. Father, as we turn our attention this morning practically and topically to the subject of being students of Scripture, we do pray that Your Spirit would draw near to us. We pray that He would impress upon us the the treasure it is that we hold in our hands when we hold the Holy Scriptures. Truly, they are more valuable, valuable than gold, even much fine gold. That to the believer, your testimonies are sweeter 
than honey. And Father, we pray that we would honor Your Word, that we would be those who delight in it, who make it our life's work, even in imitation of our Lord, to study the Scriptures, to know the Scriptures, and to know the God of whom they teach us, that we might relate to the triune God in truth, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We pray this for the glory of our God. We pray that the name of Christ might be exalted in the earth. We pray that His fame might expand and and spread abroad, that Your Word would go forth and that Christ, the subject of all of the Scriptures, would be magnified and glorified in the hearts of His people. Draw near to us, Father, we pray. We ask for the help of Your Spirit this morning. And we ask all of this for Your glory and in Christ's holy and precious name. Amen. Take up and read. Uh, The subject of this morning's sermon is encouragements for Bible reading. And in fact, I meant to tack that on to the title, uh, but it was just too long. It couldn't fit on the front of your bulletin. Uh, I will say from the outset, just as I said last week, you can see on the back of your bulletin, I've tried to give you an outline. In fact, it got a little bit lengthy this week, and I put more on there than I probably should have, but hopefully it makes it a little bit easier and clearer to follow along. Um, And as I said last week, the nature of topical sermons, it's not going to be a lengthy exposition of any one text of Scripture, but we will be referencing various places across God's Word. Um, And so I've even put references for you there, and I'm not going to necessarily wait for everyone to turn to these passages when we we talk about them, but you can kind of see where we're going, and you can turn there ahead of me. Don't be fearful of getting your Bible out, and please follow along. You can jump ahead. And uh, hopefully, Lord willing, that will help you know uh, somewhat where we're headed. Uh, St. Augustine uh, records in his own autobiography, which is simply entitled Confessions, and probably many of us are familiar with St. Augustine's Confessions. He records the story of his own conversion. And if you've never read it, I really highly encourage you to read St. Augustine's Confessions. Uh, Confessions documents Augustine's decades-long inward turmoil and his struggle with sin and his own unbelief. And in his own words, as he later recounted in a famous prayer, it is a recollection of his restless soul, seeking rest and yet finding none, until it found rest in the one true God. If you know anything about Augustine, you know that he lived in bondage for decades to sexual immorality. Uh, He had multiple concubines, um, an illegitimate child. He was a brilliantly smart man. Uh, He excelled in philosophy. He delved into different worldviews of philosophy, getting involved in something called Manichaeism, even in uh, Neoplatonic thought. And he lived a very hedonistic, uh, a very licentious life. All the while, though, his faithful mother, Monica, whom we've probably, many of us have heard of, never ceased to earnestly pray for uh, Augustine. And perhaps it was her prayers that made her son, her wayward son, so restless in his soul. One day in, in book eight, if you really just want to get a concise idea of Augustine's confessions, read book eight. Uh, it's, it's the account of his own conversion. On this particular day, his restlessness was overwhelming him. Uh, he was becoming more and more convinced of the truthfulness of Christianity, and yet he felt himself unable to break free from his bondage to sin. And Augustine describes the scene in a friend's garden. He's in the garden of one of his close friends. And while visiting with this friend in his garden, a third man suddenly joins them and comes to them and begins telling Augustine and his friend stories of others who had given their lives away to follow Christ, leaving everything behind. And Augustine becomes so overcome in his soul with shame and frustration because of his own bondage to sin that he actually just can't take it any longer. And he can't even take it to be in the presence of his two friends. And so he records how he retreats from them alone in the garden, overcome with conviction and shame, And he begins to break down and cry underneath a fig tree in the garden, despairing. And that's when the story, the key part of the story takes place. All of a sudden, as Augustine is bowed down, broken, despairing, uh, because of his bondage to sin, he hears the voice of small children 
repeating a phrase that sounded to him like they were playing some sort of game. And we're familiar with little children who play those kinds of games that just repeat something over and over, uh, something like ring around the rosy, something like that. Only the words that they were saying, Augustine could not for the life of him recall any children's game that would have the words that they were saying. They were repeating over and over in Latin, tola lege, tola lege, take it up and read, take it up and read. And Augustine took it as a sign from heaven, and he immediately ran to his copies of the epistles of Paul, and he just randomly opened it, randomly laid eyes upon it, and he began to read. And the now famous passage that his eyes landed upon is what we now know today is Romans chapter 13, verses 13 and 14. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Immediately, Augustine felt his worried mind put to ease. Uh, He felt his sin-bound heart for the first time released from bondage, and he experienced for the first time the favor of God in Christ through the reading of the Word of God. By the words of these children, tola lege. Tola lege, take it up and read. God only knows in his sovereign providence who those children were, why they were saying what they were saying, but take it up and read is a phrase that our generation in the church desperately needs to recover for ourselves. We live in a perplexing time. Never have there been more Bibles in print than today. And yet it seems that never has biblical reading and biblical literacy been lower? Uh, Consider some statistics with me. 92% of homes, that's 92% of homes in America contain at least one Bible. Most of them contain three Bibles. Every year, the Bible continues to outsell, by a long shot, every other best-selling novel. Harry Potter, you name it. The Bible way, way, way outsells it. So much so that the Bible doesn't even show up anymore on the bestsellers list because it's just assumed every year that it's in first place. But for all of the abundance of Bibles, Bible reading and Bible literacy seem to be quickly spiraling downward. According to polls, only 18% of professing Christians actually read their Bibles every day. That's less than two Christians out of ten professing Christians. And worse, 23% said they never read their Bibles. Now, you might say and be tempted to say like I am when I hear those statistics, well, okay, those polls, who knows exactly who those people are, right? And who knows if they're even genuine Christians, whether they're converted. Well, okay, that's fair enough. Let me bring it a little closer to home. One of the first things, the first questions I ask uh, Christians who come to me for help, this is my own experience, come to me for help because they aren't doing well spiritually. One of the first questions I ask is, how are your spiritual disciplines going? Specifically, how is Bible intake going? And almost always the answer for the struggling saint is not great. Uh, when a Christian comes to me struggling with, with assurance, I often ask the same question and ask them, Uh, how's Bible reading going? And often the answer is, well, it's sporadic. Uh, Let me go even further and speak of my experience within the Reformed community in general. I think that we pride ourselves so much on our commitment to the Bible and the sole authority of God's Word for our lives, and rightly so, but do our lives bear testimony to our confession? Uh, It seems to me that we have many clever ways, and I'm including myself in this, brothers and sisters. This is not a scolding sermon. This is me preaching to myself. It's Preaching is therapeutic in that sense, that you should always preach to yourself as well. It seems to me that we have many clever ways of paying lip service to the Bible, all the while neglecting the Bible. For instance, we collect Bibles. (laughs) That's a phenomenon. I mean, I I honestly don't know how many Bibles I own. Um, Most of us have all the tools one could ever dream of having to help us understand the Bible. We have books on our shelves, commentaries, concordances, uh, computer programs. Most of us own multiple study Bibles, right? We've got sheepskin Bibles, we've got goatskin Bibles, uh, we've got calfskin Bibles, we've got Bibles with margins on the side that we can make notes, Bibles with and without verse and chapter breaks. And I think that we can kind of pat ourselves on the back and look at all our tools 
and say to ourselves, look at how committed I am to God's word. Almost like a, a carpenter who is just content to forever sit in his workshop and stare at his saws, but never actually makes anything. But Revelation 1 verse 3 does not say, blessed is the one who possesses these words in his hands or on his shelf, or the blessed is the one who knows Greek or Hebrew, but blessed is he who reads and he who hears the words of this prophecy. In other words, blessed is the man that actually opens this book up and peers inside and seeks to know the God of whom it speaks. Uh, J.C. Ryle quips. I'm going to have a few J.C. Ryles for you this morning. He says, happy is the man who possesses a Bible. Happier still is he who reads it. And happiest of all is the one who not only reads it, but builds his life upon it. It seems in our day of abundance of access to the Bible, many have allowed the Bible to become something rather common rather than a precious thing. Whereas in generations gone by, it was exactly the opposite. They had almost no access to the Bible and they vigorously gathered it up as though they might never have the chance again to read it. Let me ask you this morning, just a simple question. Are you among those, according to Revelation 1-3, who are blessed in your reading of the Word of God? Honestly, it's good for us to take assessment of how we're doing every now and then. It's one of the purposes of this topical sermon. Um, the Bible is the single greatest treasure that man possesses, and yet temptation to neglect it is all around us. I want to encourage us practically this morning to do what those young children encouraged Augustine to do, to take it up and read, uh, to shift our, out, uh, our outlook, not to think of our Bibles as a chore, as a mundane discipline, but rather as a rich treasure trove God has given us for our blessing and our joy. And you can see on the back of your, your bulletin, I have five, five simple points, five encouragements to Bible reading. Um, and really it's four, and then the fifth one is just practical uh, how we get started. And so let's just work our way briefly through each of these. The first thing, the first reason for why we ought to read Scripture is because there is no other book like the Bible. There is no other book like the Bible. We ought to never forget that the Bible stands in a category of its own. It remains a cut above all other literature. Now, it's true that the Bible has a lot in common uh, with other books that we read. It comes to us in language that we understand. Uh, it comes to us in grammar. It comes to us with a context. But there is something utterly unique about the Bible, and that is its source. It is inspired by the God of heaven. 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul says, all Scripture, all the writings, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That cannot be said of any other books on the face of this planet except the Holy Scriptures that we hold in our hand. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And you might know if you've studied that passage, it's a very, very important passage for Christians to study. You might know that Paul uses a very vivid word to describe this. Uh, inspiration, as it's translated in the New King James, is, is a good word, and we need to keep the word inspiration theologically speaking. It's a massively important concept. Um, but the translation here of inspiration doesn't really quite communicate and give the, the full sense of what Paul was communi communicating uh, when, when he says that all Scripture is inspired by God. And if you've heard any of R.C. Sproul, he loved to harp on this point, and, and I am full, in full agreement with him. And so I, I want to tell you here, the word inspire, as we use it, literally means to breathe something in, to breathe in. Uh, and, and someone could hear this word that Scripture is inspired by God, and they might conceive that to mean something like, well, okay, so men apparently wrote down some pretty good stuff, and then God comes along to this, and He, he breathes it in, and He inspires it. He, he makes it Scripture. But the word Paul uses here is not the word for inspiration. It's the word, and you've probably heard it, theopneustos. And it just comes from a compound Greek word, two words, theos, which means God, and pneuma, pneustos, which means breath or spirit. Literally, it's saying all Scripture is God-breathed. That's actually how the ESV translates it. And in other words, what Paul is getting at here is just as you speak, just as I'm speaking here, breathing out 
right? I, when I'm speaking to you here, I'm exhaling air that enables me to speak. I'm expiring, right? Not in the sense of dying, but that's why we call dying expiring. It's because we breathe out for the last time. No one speaks breathing in. It's actually impossible. Well, it's possible. You sound really funny, and some of you are going to try that later. You probably don't want to try it right now, um, but it's one of my daughter's favorite voices to do. But what Paul is saying here is that the Scriptures are not God breathing in something and making it Scripture. He's saying the Scriptures themselves are God's breathing out. They are His very breath. In other words, Paul is stressing the ultimate source of the Scriptures, that this book flows from God's mouth. It flows from God's breath. Allow me to give you a human example to drive this very important distinction home. I can go, go into my office and I can pick up off my shelf any of my favorite books. I might pick up uh, Herman Bovink, Systematics, Louis Burkhoff, Systematic Theology. By the way, if you want Systematic Theologies, I highly recommend Bovink, Burkhoff. Can't go wrong with them. I love these men. Very thankful for these men. They wrote wonderful things about God, wonderfully true things about God, but their books are not the words of God. They do, not, they do not carry the authority of the Word of God because their writings themselves are not God-breathed. They didn't proceed out of the mouth of God. Now, when I read them, uh, as much as I am reading their thoughts, Bovink and Burkhoff are not themselves speaking to me. Right? Bovink and Burkhoff have been dead and in, in glory for a long, long time. But when I read the Bible, I'm not just reading men's words about God. God Himself is speaking to me. Every time you open up the Scriptures, God is presently speaking to you with full divine authority because they are His words. This is why the writer to the Hebrews, for example, it's another uh, passage that I've referenced for you here in this first point. In Hebrews 4.12, massively important text, not sure if we always grasp the significance of it, but this is why the writer to the Hebrews says the Word of God is what? Living and active. In other words, Scripture is not just a dead letter written on a page that died when the men who penned them died. Indeed, the, the writer of the Hebrews actually often displays his theology of the Scripture being inspired when, for instance, he quotes the Old Testament often. One, one example is Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. And he quotes the Psalms, and he says, he does not say, as the Holy Spirit once said, but instead he says, the Holy Spirit is saying. Present tense. Even though the Psalms he's quoting were written hundreds of years before him, He's saying that the Psalms are always living and active in a way that no other book is living and active because its author, God himself, is always living and always active. Now, what are, what are the implications of this? Why do I why draw this out first? Well, first of all, that we have to start here. It's important for us. It's good for us as Christians to be reminded that the, word of, that the Bible is the very word of God. And the main implication of this I want to draw out is as Spurgeon famously quipped, he said, visit many books, but live in the Bible. Visit many books, but live in the Bible. Do you, do I, consider my visits to Burkhoff, your visits to Sproul, your visits to MacArthur, but brief expeditions to see a friend before returning to the place where you live, the Bible. Now, don't get me wrong. We, we need other people in the Christian life, right? One of my applications last week from talking about God's guidance is that we need other people. We should not despise the writings and the wisdom of other Christians. Please do read Sproul. Uh, read the great gifts God has given to His church, but don't read them expecting to find the perfections of the Scriptures or even to seek to replace the reading of the Scriptures with these books. All of these things we read should point us back to God's book the Bible itself, and all of them would tell you that. All of the godly men and women of the ages past would tell you, read me as a friend, but then go back to your home and live in God's book. All other writings err except this book. Uh, only this book contains exactly the warnings, the comforts, the encouragements, the challenges, the examples that we need for our perseverance and edification. So that's the first encouragement, is that the Bible is unique above all other books. It is inspired by God. That brings us to the second thing that I want us to consider uh, this morning. The second encouragement, Jesus expects those who possess the Scriptures to read them. Jesus expects those who possess the Scriptures to read them. 
And this is really clear as daylight all over the scriptures in general. I doubt there's many here who question this if you're a Christian. Um, but I want, I want to think just for a moment about the Lord Jesus himself. We clearly see that, the, that our Lord expected others who possess the scriptures to know them. And we see that the Lord himself was the supreme student of the scriptures. Just read, and I've, I've put a few passages, uh, references here you can look up now or later. Just read through the gospel the Gospels of our Lord, and see how often you find the Lord Jesus saying things like this. Luke 10, verse 26. He asks his opponents, what is written in the law? How do you read it? Right? He's, he's just assuming his opponent's knowledge of the Scriptures, and he's asking him, what's your interpretation? Certainly you've read that. What's your interpretation? Or Mark 12, verse 10, again to his opponents. It's amazing how Jesus is most often quoting Scripture to those who are challenging him. Uh, Mark 12, verse 10, he says, have you not read this scripture? He goes on to quote Psalm 118. Uh, Matthew 19, 4, have you not read? Uh, We could go elsewhere in the Gospel of John. John 5, verse 39, he says, you search the scriptures. In other words, all over the place, Jesus assumes those who possess the scriptures should avail themselves of the scriptures. But even more than that, our Lord Jesus himself is the supreme example of the student of Scripture. Now, at that point, someone might say, yeah, but, you know, Jesus knew the Scripture and went into those uh, scriptural knife fights with a bit of an advantage, didn't he? I mean, of course he was able to take all of his opponents uh, to school in terms of their knowledge of God's Word. After all, he was what? God in the flesh. Which is true. Jesus is God in the flesh. He's the divine Word. John 1.1. He's the Word who became flesh. John 1.14. But that's where we need to understand our Christology very, very precisely and very accurately. Some people say, you know, we live in a day that they say, we don't need doctrine, we don't need to talk about Christology. Even to say a word like that would offend some. Um, But here's the thing we need to understand. Our doctrine of Christ is what fuels our worship of Christ. And I suspect that many Christians often diminish the perfection of Christ's obedience simply because they assume that really Jesus didn't obey just like I need to obey in his humanity, but he had kind of this cheater backstop that he always relied upon his divine nature. Let me give you a tiny bit of history. It's, it's, it's worth for us to know our councils as a church, uh, the Church of Christ, the important councils where the church has settled important doctrinal distinctions. Chalcedon is one of those very important ones in in the year 451 where the church settled Christ being one person who possesses two natures. One person who has two natures. One human nature, one divine nature. But the council was very careful to stress that while the one person of Christ, right, there's not two Christs, that while the one person of Christ possessed both a human and a divine nature, they were careful to say that the natures are not to be themselves confused or mixed. In other words, the human nature is not deified. Uh, The divine nature is not humanized. And here's the upshot of all that. The upshot of all that is that when we see Jesus' perfect obedience in every respect, including his mastery of the scriptures, his mastery of the word of God, we ought to understand it as Jesus doing so in his humanity, just like we are called to read and learn the scriptures in our humanity. This is why, this is just one example of why it's so utterly unthinkable, and yet so many in our day say this, that we're being conformed to Jesus, or we're being, uh, we're imitating Jesus when we actually don't even know a thing of the scriptures. That's a contradiction, biblically speaking. Christian, I want to commend to you this morning to study the Christ who made it his life's work to study the Scriptures. We get glimpses of this, don't we? For instance, Luke, in the beginning of his Gospel, he says that Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature with men. Now, the divine being is perfect. The divine being doesn't grow in anything. It cannot grow. It is perfect. It's never becoming. It is always pure, perfect being. This is Jesus' humanity that's growing in knowledge, growing in wisdom, growing in his knowledge of God's Word. And how did he do it? He did it the same way we must do it, by acquainting himself with the Scriptures, by reading the Scriptures, uh, by studying them, meditating, right? Psalm 1, meditating on the law of God day and night. E- even sitting in the temple, right? We catch a glimpse in the early chapters of Luke. 
sitting in the temple when he's a young boy, studying the scriptures as he's discussing and asking questions of the teachers of Israel. You know, I think we can even go further than this uh, and say that not only does Jesus expect us to read the scriptures, but he expects us to read all the scriptures. Right? Think of Matthew 4, verse 4. Uh, when Satan tempts Jesus, and he tempts him in his second temptation to turn stones into bread. Um, and what is Jesus' response? Jesus' response is, man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, right? How can we live by every word of God if we have not read every word of God? And keep in mind, when Jesus quoted that, the Bible at that point was the Old Testament. That was Jesus' Bible. the Old Testament. The New Testament hadn't been written yet. Does our Bible reading reflect Jesus' conviction that every God-breathed word is profitable? You know, I was convicted of this this week, and I realized I haven't read the Minor Prophets in a long time. <laughs> and you know what? I need to actually give due credit, as Jesus said, every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I started reading Hosea. Uh, how long since you visited the Minor Prophets? How long since you visited Lamentations? Ezekiel? Numbers. Luther, uh, famously, he, he would read through the Bible twice a year. And he said, he said, if you picture the Bible to be a mighty tree and every word is a branch, he said, I have shaken every branch from that tree uh, because I wanted to know what was on it and what it meant. That's, that should be our treatment of God's word. Before we move on to the, to the third encouragement this morning, I just want to draw out one, one final thing. Notice in the title of this point, if you're looking at your bulletin, I included the words, as it's expected of those who possess the Scriptures, to read the Scriptures. You might know this, you might not know this. Prior, before four or five hundred years ago, the idea of getting up in the morning, getting your cup of coffee and sitting down with your whole copy of God's Word, the entirety of the Scriptures, would have absolutely amazed Christians, even to think that that would be a possibility. For most of the history of the church, you didn't possess your own copy of the Scriptures, let alone the entirety of the inspired canon. You heard the Word of God in church. Uh, it was publicly read at length. That's why Paul tells Timothy what he does, that while I, until I come, give yourself to the public reading of Scripture. That was much of the people's Bible intake. Um, and as much, they, as much as they could, they committed it to memory. But here's the point. They had limited access to the Scriptures by necessity. We often have limited access to the Scriptures by choice. And that's a very, very different issue. And the thing that I just want to raise for our attention is the principle that Jesus often has on His lips. To whom much is given, much will be required. You know, it's not the same thing to be ignorant of the Scriptures because we do not possess them as it is to be ignorant of the Scriptures because we don't avail ourselves of them. Uh, we will give an account on the last day of every good gift every stewardship God has allotted to us. And in terms of accountability and culpability to know our Bibles, the English-speaking world of the last two or three centuries, we're going to be at the front of the line in terms of giving an account of what have we done with God's great gift. We should take advantage of this blessing that the Lord has given us in the Scriptures. Thirdly, third encouragement, the Scriptures contain knowledge most essential to man. The Scriptures contain knowledge most essential to man, and I'm getting this from 2 Timothy 3, verse 15, one of the Scriptures we opened up with. Uh, Paul reminds Timothy, and if you, know, if you remember, Timothy was raised by a godly mother and grandmother, and they taught him the Scriptures of the Old Testament from his youth, and that's the context of verse 15 in chapter 3. Paul's reminding Timothy, he says, quote, "...how from your childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you what?" wise for salvation, salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The Scriptures are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. You know, we live in a day, and even our brother Mel, I think, alluded to this this morning in our Sunday school hour, we live in a day in which learning abounds and yet wisdom wanes. People are going to school for longer in their lives than ever before learning more and more about less and less. College has become the expectation, just the universal expectation of our young people. The internet has exploded the world of deep thought and access to information. And yet we must never forget 
that no matter how fluent we are in the knowledge of the world, if we die ignorant of the subject matter of the Scriptures, we will not save our souls from hell. This is one of those counterintuitive things. You can be the most brilliant... Mel was bringing out just some of the deep things this morning. You can be the most brilliant astrophysicist, quantum physicist, experts in the world. You can, you can run circles around everyone in equations, in theories, atoms and molecules. You can speak ten language, uh, languages. You can know world history and geography like the back of your hand. You can have the most agile mind for deep thought. And in the, eye, the eyes of the world, you might appear to be the apex of wisdom. And yet, void of true knowledge of God in the Scriptures, eternity will prove that you are among the most foolish of fools. And on the other hand, you can be a simple plowboy. You remember the story of William Tyndale and how he vowed that before his work was done, the plowboy would know more of the Scriptures even than the most learned in the Roman Catholic Church. You can be a simple plowboy. You cannot even know how to read or write. Your grammar might be all mixed up when you speak. You don't know an atom from a chair. And you can be full of the Word of God. Wise above all the wisdom of this age. Comforted in life. Peaceful in death. Because you know God in Christ. Ryle again hits, hits the point right on the head. He says, chemistry never silenced a guilty conscience. Mathematics never healed a broken heart. All the sciences in the world never smoothed down a dying pillow. But you know what does do all those things? The scriptures, which make you wise for salvation. A true understanding of God in His glory. His holiness, His justice, His mercy, and His love and His goodness. A keen awareness of our utter sinfulness before Him. Our desert of His wrath. Our guilt before Him. Our condemnation. Uh, childlike faith in the perfections of the Lord Jesus Christ. Trusting Him. Trusting His cross. Where God's love and God's justice have met. Trusting in His dying in my place for my sins. Trusting in His resurrection from the grave in glory and power. Proving He's victorious over sin. He's victorious over death itself. Victorious over Satan. That will comfort the dying creature as he gets ready to depart into worlds unknown. Parents, what are we teaching our children? It's sad in our day that the average child leaves high school and college knowing everything that could be possibly known about social media. They know every last detail from Hollywood. What's going on with Brad Pitt? What's going on with Angelina Jolie? And yet they don't know whether a boy is a girl. They don't know whether a human life is more valuable than a bird. Depression amongst young people is at, a, as it, is at an all-time high. Suicide is rising among young people at extravagant rates. They're morally confused because they are ignorant of the Scriptures. They are wise in this world but fools as regards salvation. May we as parents do our best to teach our children that knowing and believing the Scriptures is literally, and that not, I don't mean that in a way that's exaggerated, literally infinitely more important than whether our children go to college, whether our children achieve their dreams, whatever they do in this world, may they know God through His Word. Number four, God promises blessing to the one who reads the Word. This is the fourth encouragement to read God's Word. God promises blessing to the one who reads the Word. You know, I, I liken the reading of God's Word, the regular reading of God's Word. It's like a constant immunization uh, that fights against the maladies that come against the soul. Sometimes we ask questions like, well, how much do I really need to read, your, read my Bible? Well, ask yourself this. How often does the flesh rise up against you? Uh, how active is the devil to snuff out your faith? How frequent are temptations in the world to sin? That's how much you need the Word of God. That's how much you need the Scriptures. I want to just briefly point out to you three explicit blessings the Scripture promises to give to those who read them and believe them. And I've put, put them on, on your handout here. Uh, first of all, the Scriptures give the blessing of faith. Right? And a, and a massive obvious text to go for this is Romans 10, verse 17. The Apostle Paul says, faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the Word 
of Christ. And that's true in two senses, distinct yet uh, connected senses. The scriptures are the means that God uses to bring about both initial faith and they are the means that he nourishes our faith. First of all, initial faith. I want to speak to you just, just briefly. If you're here and you're not a Christian, um, and perhaps you don't know quite, uh, you're hearing the sermon on the Word of God about Jesus, and you're not sure where you stand with Christ. You're not sure if the Bible is really God's Word. I want to plead with you this morning, just very practical application for you. Read the Bible. Read the Bible. Give it a chance to stand on its own two feet. Uh, we all know that it's dishonest to doubt that which we have never personally looked into. And perhaps you've heard much from others, professors maybe in school, about why the Bible isn't true, why the Bible can't be God's Word. But I want to challenge you, have you ever actually personally read the Bible that you doubt? I challenge you, let the Bible prove to you whether it be the Word of God. And perhaps in reading, God Himself will give this gift of faith that Paul speaks about, and you will see truly God is in this book. So the, the reading of the Word of God gives initial faith. It also nourishes faith. Uh, Christian, I want to speak to you. Do you realize that God's giving you the gift of faith is not just a one-time static deposit? Um, the initial gift was sovereignly dispensed to you by the Spirit of God through the ministry of hearing the Word or reading the Word. Uh, but then the Spirit also continues to stoke the fires and fan the flame of your faith through that same Word. The same Word that gave you initial faith. And this is so important, very practical for us as Christians. You know, often, I, this is speaking from my experience, and I'm sure I've talked to, to many others who have the same challenge. Often when we're struggling, and we're feeling just dry as dust, spiritually speaking, we're unbelieving in our hearts, we're dull to the things of God, usually our tendency is to begin to just look inward. And we begin scrutinizing, am I believing? Am I believing? I want, I want to believe more. Am I having faith? But when you do that, all you're looking at now is yourself. Which, in case you haven't realized, yourself is a very bad object for you to put your faith in. The object of our faith is not our faith. The object of our faith is Christ Himself, as presented to us in the Word. And so the best thing for the doubting soul is not endless introspection, but looking outward and holding continually before your eyes Christ in the Word of God. Second thing, second blessing the Scriptures give, uh, give us is assurance. Are you struggling with assurance? Bible reading strengthens assurance of grace. 1 John 5, verse 13. This is a text I'm so thankful is in our Bibles. Uh, John writes, 1 John 5, 13. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. In other words, John is writing to those who are believers. They've believed in Christ. He, he understands them to be trusting Christ. But he tells them then why he's writing. He says, I'm writing to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. In other words, in John's theology, and it needs to be in our theology, you can truly believe in Christ and yet not know that you have eternal life. And yet, why does John say he's writing? He's writing to give assurance that you may know. Again, if you're struggling with assurance, which all of us do, some, to us, uh, some of us more often, some of us less often, the worst thing you can do is isolate yourself and cut yourself off from the Scriptures because it is the Scriptures that God uses to give assurance. That as you read them, the Spirit of God comes upon you and bears witness, as Paul says, uh, bears witness with your spirit that, yes, I believe this. Yes, I am a child of God. That is how God nourishes our assurance. It's through the reading of the Word of God. Thirdly, the Scriptures give us comfort. And I'm not going to say much for time's sake. I'll just read you Romans 15, 4. Paul says, For whatever things were written before, talking about the Old Testament, were written for our learning, that through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Scriptures also give hope to the believer. Lastly, let, let us for time's sake wrap, wrap things up here. How to, how to get started. Uh, very briefly, perhaps some of us are sitting here this morning and you're thinking, okay, I'm convinced. I want to be a person of the Word. I want to be a student of the Word. 
and yet you're wondering, how do I get started? Here are just several, and I've just listed them for you. You can tell I didn't have room on the back of your handout, and so I just started separating things by commas, because I figured at least if they're in front of you, you can take them home and think about them. Um, here are some practical suggestions to getting started, to being students of the Word and readers of the Word. First of all, start now. Don't, me don't merely sit here right now and wish that you would start reading your Bible. Don't merely resolve that you'll read your Bible. Don't merely intend to read or think about reading, but read. Start this afternoon. The way to do a thing is to do it. And then continue tomorrow and do, a, do it again and the next day. Don't put it off is my point or you will never pick it up. This will just be another one of those sermons where you heard it, you're pricked in conscience, you made no practical steps to change anything. And guess what? Things don't change when we don't plan to change them. So start now. Secondly, Read your Bible with a desire to meet with God. Pray Psalm 119, verse 18, when you come to your Bible. The psalmist prays, open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. Don't just swoop in on your Bible for a brief moment and, find, and expect to mine out its finest treasures. Be like Jacob. Remember Jacob. As Jacob wrestled with God, and he refused, you remember, to let God go until he blessed him, so we should wrestle with the Scriptures and say, I refuse to let you go until you bless me. Thirdly, read with a determination of obedience. A determination of obedience. God will not bless the reader of His Word who does not intend to obey it. Jesus says to His disciples in the Upper Room Discourse, John 13, 17, You know these things? Blessed are you if you do them. Resolve as you read. This takes discipline. Resolve as you read to pay attention, to make personal application of how you should respond to this portion and that portion of Scripture. Next, read the whole Bible in an orderly way. And we touched on this a bit, obviously. Find a Bible plan. Very, very practical advice. Find a Bible plan that keeps you on course for pulling, as Luther said, pulling on every branch of this big tree. Uh, don't leave it to chance, or you will simply, you'll do what we always do. When you leave it to chance, you'll simply tread the paths with which you're familiar, and sooner or later, those same Psalms, those same, you know, wherever you go, your favorite portions of Scripture, they'll get old eventually, and you'll just leave off altogether. And I don't know how to, where to even begin. Find a Bible plan. It'll keep you accountable to reading through all of God's Word. Next, second to last, take a break from social media and other distractions. And I say this one to you personally, as a person who has to force myself to do this every so often. Things like social media, YouTube, basically our whole world nowadays, which revolves around three-second sound bites of information and entertainment, these things do things to our minds. And what I mean by that is they train our minds not to be content with prolonged study and meditation. We become addicted. The more we are in these things, we become addicted to being mindlessly amused. And when it comes to things which require effort, like reading, studying, meditating, we cannot sustain it for long. And so you might consider taking a break and uh, rationing your use of these things. And finally, arrange your priorities. None of us can legitimately say that we do not have time for God's Word. If we're honest, what we should say is, I have too many priorities that rank higher than God's Word. And this requires repentance. This requires confession of our sin, turning from the idolatry and the neglect of the one true God, and to begin to reprioritize our lives. Uh, go to bed earlier so that you can get up early in the morning and read. Uh, determine with your spouse that you won't watch that show or you only watch it to a, a certain time uh, so that you might uh, participate in Bible reading. Guard your reading of the Word of God because it is your life. Well, in closing, our time is gone. Tola lege. Take it up and read. May God help us. May He be our helper to honor Him and to honor His Holy Word. Happy is the man who owns a Bible. Happier still he who reads it, and happiest of all, he who obeys and builds his life upon it. Amen. Let's pray.